Does a new Labour government make a difference? And I think it's it's genuinely very early to tell. On the one hand, just after the election, almost the first thing that Keir Starmer did was to go and meet the, the leaders of the devolved nations. He also had meetings with Labour mayors. This was clearly a symbolic attempt to say we want to reset relationships across the United Kingdom. And secondly, we want to have a different approach to the government of England. But it's it's not yet clear to me, at least, what that actually means in practice when it comes down to the day to day detail of government. Hello, I'm Brendan Donnelly. I'm the director of the Federal Trust. Uh, we talk a lot about Europe in the Federal Trust videos, but today we're going to concentrate more on the state of the British Union, of the state of the United Kingdom. And we've got two very distinguished and uh, familiar um, friends of the Federal Trust to, to join in the conversation. First, uh, we've got Bindua Jones, um, who's a, a prolific writer on, on constitutional questions, and he's uh, an advocate in particular of a nationwide constitutional conversation. Sometimes we make the mistake of just talking about Scotland or Wales or Northern Ireland. Um, he's very much uh, in favour of a holistic, synthetic point of view. Um, he's written um, uh, along these lines, uh, advocating a, uh, a, a United Kingdom state that will be a mixture of federal and confederal elements. So we very much welcome the federal elements and we're trying to convince him that confederalism can become federalism uh, in, a, in, in an ideal world. Um, John Denham, welcome John, uh, is uh, at the moment Professor and Director of the Centre for English Identity and Politics at Southampton University. Uh, he's a, a former Labour MP and uh, indeed uh, uh, was the Secretary of State for Communities and Local Government. Uh, John, uh, can I start with you? Uh, we've had a general election recently. Um, we've had a, a turbulent few years leading up to the general election. Um, do you think that the United Kingdom um, as a polity, as a, a political entity, uh, is is more stable, more robust now than it was five years ago? Or is it the same? Uh, does this new Labour government, and perhaps as a, a former Labour government minister, you'd have a particular insight in this, um, is this new Labour government going to make a difference? Has it made a difference already to the stability of the United Kingdom? There's a lot to un un unpack there, but let me just ask, answer it in two ways, because they're very good questions. I mean, I've thought for a long time that while breakup of the United Kingdom is obviously possible at some point in the future, a more likely future was that would be the continuation of a union of discontent in which nobody was terribly happy um, and uh, nobody really thought it was working for them, but nobody could really see a way forward. And if anything, I think you would say that events of recent years have intensified that feeling, not least because no part of the union can really say that it has managed to deliver on the things that most voters worry about much more than they worry about the constitution. So the cost of living, the state of the health service and so on. In different leaderships and with different national stories, no one can really say, well, we've done it very well and everybody else has done it badly. And there's lots of reasons for that. But I think that leads to a general sense of dissatisfaction. But it also means that the prevailing political leaderships have been challenged in different ways. So in the UK, but particularly in England, the conservative leadership of the last 15 years has been defeated. Uh, Wales still led by Labour, but Labour is clearly under a sort of pressure that it hasn't been in the past. The Scottish National Party have lost their, their electoral magic. The balance of powers between the parties in Northern Ireland have changed. So it's quite a difficult... It doesn't mean the union's in crisis, but if you say, are we all getting from this, the benefits that you would like to think come from a strong union, uh, the answer is obviously no. Uh, your second question is really, does this make a difference? Does a new Labour government make a difference? And I think it's it's genuinely very early to tell. On the, on the one hand, just after the election, almost the first thing that Keir Starmer did was to have was was to have a, a go to go and meet the, the leaders of the devolved nations. He also had meetings with Labour mayors. This was clearly 
a symbolic attempt to say we want to reset relationships across the United Kingdom. And secondly, we want to have a different approach to the government of England. But it's it's not yet clear to me, at least, what that actually means in practice when it comes down to the day to day detail of government, because it could go in a number of different directions. Devolution in England could turn out to be really quite limited. Um, there have been stories suggesting a desire by the UK government to intervene more in the affairs of the devolved nations, for example, trying to ensure that they have mayoral combined authorities as, as they do in England. None of this is entirely clear. So um, we'll have to wait a bit at the moment. But I, I don't think I've picked up any signs. I see a lot of signs of people wanting to improve relationships across the United Kingdom not many signs of wanting to open up the constitutional debate in a more fundamental way. Well, perhaps there's a, a parallel there to the reset, the supposed reset of relations with the European Union. We, we can talk further a, a, about that later. Um, yes. That's a rather cynical view on my part, and you're w welcome to contradict it later, later on. But okay. let's get, get something from uh, Lindor first. Um, what would your answer be to the question I just put to John? Well, thank you, Brendan. Um, yeah, very much with John on this, uh, but you know, the institutional policy and cultural reforms necessary to establish a more stable and, dare I say, consensual island-wide structure do need to be examined seriously. You know, Decades-long shifts of public opinion and national party political dynamics across the nations have led, are leading to increasingly divergent views about our constitutional future and the situation only exacerbated by Brexit. As I've already said before, your robust improvements to intergovernmental relations across our parliaments are essential as a matter of priority, not just in themselves, but also as the foundation for a constructive set of negotiations on constitutional change should the need arise. But in saying that, of course, there are benefits to our present union, which we must acknowledge. We have a set of common values, democracy, equality, personal liberty and the rule of law, which are shared by unionists and non-unionists alike. Our economic union secures us a leading role in international organisations such as G7, WTO, International Monetary Fund and the OECD and our social union support spending on a basic level of common welfare which helps redistribute some wealth based on need. And our security, of course, places us in a good position with the UN Security Council and NATO. But yes, there are significant changes are needed on how our governments, and I do stress plural, governments interact. But let's not throw the baby out of the bathwater. And I suspect that's where the ground is today. We've moved from a position where there was increasing polarisation across the nations in terms of exploring our constitutional futures. I think with a new government in place, maybe we can sit down together, take the best of what we've got, but also understand that uh, there are critical elements of our relationships and how we interact that can be vastly improved. Thank you. Um, John, uh, you, you said that uh, a number of ideas were floating around uh, uh, in the, the Labour government's uh, ambience of discussion. Um, what are the particular elements um, uh, of the present situation that you'd like to see, as it were, refreshed or, or, or uh, tackled in, in a more vigorous way? Well, I think one is undoubtedly to reform the machinery of intergovernmental relations. Some things were tried about this under the previous government, but they seem to have run into the sand. This is basically the formal structures through which, as it is at the moment, the United Kingdom government coordinates with the devolved nations. I think there are two elements that are very important to that. One is we should have, and we don't have it at the moment, but a recognition that the UK government has two functions. It is the government of the United Kingdom, but it is also the government of England. And those two things get completely mixed up with each other to the great annoyance, understandably, of a lot of people in Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. So they need to make the machinery of intergovernmental relationships more robust. I would suggest it should be put on a statutory basis and they ought to have some mechanism in there for very clearly be, well, I would argue, obviously, for a delineated governmental system for England. But in the absence of that, 
at least a formal mechanism for being clear when the UK government is talking about England and when it's talking about the United Kingdom. Uh, one of the symbolic things that could be done, and I know it's controversial with some things, is we found out in the Miller case in the Supreme Court that the Sewell Convention, which was the rule that the UK Parliament would not legislate for Scotland or Wales without consent, was a convention. It wasn't actually something that could be enforced in law. And I think that brings us to the point where actually you have to protect constitutional devolution from the creep either of the UK government executive, but particularly of the UK parliament with its massive England majority. So those two things would make a big difference. Um, there are some new kids on the block, if you like. There's the Council of Nations and Regions, which has now met with great high profile. But I think that's a body that might end up satisfying no one because mm -hmm. it, I don't, you know, I can't speak for any of the nations, but it's a bit odd when you have Leaders, first ministers of devolved nations, and in the case of Northern Ireland, both the first and the deputy ministers, they have come through a parliamentary process with a full electoral franchise, and they exercise massive responsibility over the runnings of a nation. Um, Andy Burnham has a budget, the most you know, best known English mayor, has a budget less than a third the size of that of Manchester City Council. And the idea that the mayors and the leaders of nations are somehow sitting down on equal terms, I think, is a is is a problem. So, yes, it's good to get people together to talk about UK wide issues. But England needs a much clearer representation of devolved English local government. And I think the first ministers deserve the respect as of, of being treated as the democratically elected politicians that they are. Isn't one of the difficulties there uh, that the Westminster tends to think that it, it is really the repository of sovereign trinity and other people get little pieces of the cake, um, but that there's no great difference between being the first minister and being a mayor. You're not from the centre, the Westminster bubble, yeah. therefore you don't really matter. That is absolutely right. And people will remember uh, it, it's disputed whether Tony Blair described the new Welsh Assembly as it then was or the Scottish Parliament as a parish council. But he undoubtedly referred to one of them in that sort of form. And that was that is very typical, not just of a Westminster attitude, but if we're honest, of a very Anglo centric view of the Constitution, which you know, sits with the idea of Westminster sovereignty, but it is essentially that the union represents England on a large scale. And there's not much difference between the interests of England and those of the rest of the union. And one of the challenges we've got, when everyone talks about the future of the union in terms of what might happen in Northern Ireland, what might happen in Scotland, even what might happen in Wales, the critical thing is if you can't change that mindset in England, that's the biggest problem the union's got. It's not the bits that are not England, it's the bit that is England that's the problem. We'll come back to that in a moment. But Lindor, what, what, what would you say about the elements of the Constitution that need refreshment or looking at again? Well, look, the central place of England and its uh, parliamentary arrangements and the formulation of any strategy to stabilise our union must be considered seriously, as John's highlighting, including deeper and consistent devolution within the nation itself. Your future relations between Westminster and the parliaments in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland also do need reframing on principles of partnership working, where all parties seek to promote a culture of mutual learning, respect and better engagement. But going back to England, you know, in terms of economic activity, you know, the UK, with its stark contrast between the prosperous southeast and other less affluent areas, is one of the most unequal of the world's developed states. And if I could refer for a moment to the State of the North report by the IPPR. It details that uh, Northern England's economic activity is consistently 3% lower than the rest of England. Its median pay is £1.60 less every hour, and its employment rate is consistently 3 to 4% behind. A large proportion of the English population is frustrated by the way in which its sole national forum as John already has explained, tangled within the UK government and Westminster operates, and not least in the manner in which state funds are allocated and in growing concern over regional inequality. So the half-hearted rollout of devolution uh, with weak fundraising abilities and powers across England thus far is inadequate, and it's done little to influence opinion that the UK centre uh, has a uh, fixation with 
in the southeast. And these feelings of disempowerment possibly could have been at the heart of the Brexit result. Uh, you know, did many blame the wrong union for uh, the state of affairs? John, uh, that's probably a question of a, of a different nature for a different type. <laughs> well, I don't think necessarily it is. I, I, I think uh, Anglo-centric um, values have perhaps um, distorted the way in which... Uh, Sorry, I mean, yes, Anglo-centric values have distorted perhaps the nature of the United Kingdom. And then even within this um, universe of Anglo-centrism, it's Southeast Anglo-centrism, which has um, uh, given a, a further distortion. Um, but but how is this avoidable? Um, John, what specifically do you think would, would, would be... Uh, a set of uh, of approaches and institutions um, that might make England a better governed place and a happier member of the United Kingdom. The first, there's a set of changes that would begin to say to England, in terms of policy. Let's forget about identity for the moment, but in terms of policy, you are a political nation with your own democracy and control of your own affairs. And I think the two things that are critical to that are a radical decentralization within England um, through the development of English devolution. And secondly, changes to the structure of governance of England, which actually means we stop talking about the United Kingdom uh, as though it's the same as, as, as England. Now, the challenges there are, are big, and we need to step back and understand that um, England did not used to be as centralized as it was, right? This is a recent development of the last 40 years, uh, really up to the Second World War and for most of the period after the Second World War until the early 1980s, English local government had a level of autonomy, policy autonomy, fiscal autonomy, ability to deliver public services that way exceeds anything that anyone's talking about in English devolution at the moment. And it's the, the 40 years over which it was financially crushed, the powers were taken away, its ability to de deliver services stopped or privatised, and more and more powers were accumulated at the centre. So we're actually talking about reversing a very deep-seated uh, problem, added to which the UK state which governs England, has evolved in a way which has two characteristics. One is individual government departments which work don't work together and actually mean that all, therefore, coordination of policy is impossible at the local level because it's not done at the national level. And secondly, all roads lead to the Treasury. And the Treasury, above all, insists on trying to maintain control, not over how well money is spent, but how much money is spent at local level. So you're talking about a fundamental change in the level of ambition on devolution, which makes it clear that England and its localities have wide areas of political policy, financial choice, and secondly, changes to the way in which Whitehall is organised to allow that to happen. Now, if we can do those things, I mean, if you want or not, we can go through the, the detail of doing that. If you do those things, then suddenly the public debate in England becomes an England debate. And it's clear that it's not talking about the United Kingdom. I think that's essential for tackling the sort of regional inequalities that Glendale has been talking about. And it's also important for the, for the politics of the union and the ability to talk about England as a nation with its own polity. No, can, can I add to that? I mean, 25 fine, years, you know. Can you take up one particular point? Uh, it seems to me that the, 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 the British state uh, finds it very difficult to think in, in conceptual terms. Now, there's no difficulty in saying there ought to be a bit more devolution to Manchester or a bit more devolution to the southwest. But the idea of an overall blueprint, which was a, a devolutionary strategy, seems to be something very difficult for the British state to wrap its head around. Do, do, do you agree with that? I can, uh, I, I can fully appreciate what you're saying. I think uh, there's a lack or there's a, there hasn't been a real attempt uh, to, uh, to formulate a set of overarching principles that can help inform a debate, a sensible conversation towards a better model of governance for all, for all of us. 
you know, if we pull out some key themes, and I'll just touch on these, you know, if we first focus on solidarity as an expression of our unity, you know, this principle should easily guide the activities of decision makers across all our nations in a broader fashion, particularly when we talk about concurrent or shared powers. If we think then of subsidiarity as an expression of our diversity, um, you know, there's a powerful argument that giving people control particularly over their domestic affairs, and thereby also the responsibility for raising money to pay for them, is a perfectly legitimate discipline to apply. And then desperately and uh, needed in our current muddled uh, uh, settlement, there's a need for clarity. You know, it is key that the public understand which tier of government holds what powers so that the electorate can make sensible choices. You know, I do strongly believe, you know, as... Brendan, you mentioned at the start of this uh, recording, uh, the answer to our predicament is wider than that narrowly defined by the separate constitutional debates ongoing within the four nations. In truth, we have a responsibility not only to others within our respective constituent parts, but also to the whole. And consent, after all, is the foundation of trust in any political system. So by balancing the principles of, and I mentioned earlier, unity, with diversity, and also balancing change with an element of continuity, we can move, I hope, together towards a better conversation and even a better solution when uh, when we finally reach, or if we ever do reach that point. Now, John, you mentioned some specific uh, avenues that you'd like explored, uh, but can we step back a bit uh, and, and ask whether you think that this government or the the commentariat uh, are doing enough to prepare public and elite opinion for the need for such changes. Um, are we rolling the picture, as it were, in the right way to make people understand that such a conversation and, and changes along the lines that you've proposed are necessary? Well, I don't think these issues are being debated far uh, widely enough. Uh, no, and I don't think the state, as as you've just talked about it, is conceptualizing the change that is necessary. The really big question, I think, over the next couple of years is the extent to which the UK government understands that what it wants to deliver, the missions that it's talked about, about net zero and growth and so on, are incompatible with trying to run the country from London. That actually what, what you have to have, because these are complex problems that need to be resolved in different ways in different places, you need both clear devolution of powers within England and across the Union, but also improved collaboration between those different levels of power. So it's not just a matter of, uh, I, mean, I agree we need to be clear about what's held at what level, but that's not the end of the day. Once you've got your powers properly distributed, you then have to get the different layers of powers working together correctly, because things like net, net zero vary from a local community agreeing to have a uh, a wind turbine and, and its own energy supply to national regulation about um, uh, about the energy in industry. These have to work together. So I think the really interesting question, Brendan, is whether almost the technocratic challenge of building a state that can deliver the things that people want to see begins to be understood as also a constitutional challenge and vice versa, so that we talk about the Constitution, not just in terms of principles, but actually what distribution of power enables us to tackle the regional inequalities that we've got or these energy problems that we've got. And the technocratic challenge needs to understand that you can have the best policy design you like in Whitehall. You are quite quite incapable of delivering it while Whitehall holds on to all of the tools. And that I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I'm absolutely mm -hmm. certain that should be at the that should be where we're all trying to point the debate at the moment. So constitution and if you like tech, technocracy, machinery of government are seen as all different ways of looking at the same single debate. That isn't happening at the moment, but it should do. Yeah. What what, what can be done uh, to, to make that debate happen? Do you see any signs that, that it, it is beginning to formulate itself? I think, you know, if, you know, if we sort of speak simply of human nature, you know, there's a fear of change and also there's a 
sometimes a uh, there's there's a comfort in the status quo. So I think we need to talk about evolution and uh, how do we get from where we are to a place where uh, we can work more uh, comfortably uh, in our uh, in our constitutional arrangements. You know, the fundamental issue of our time is that the administrations of Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland cover nearly fifteen percent of these island inhabitants. Consequently intergovernmental relations have become marginal to the affairs of Westminster. So I would hope an all-encompassing package of devolution for England would beneficially ensure that decentralised bodies become focal to island-wide affairs rather than uh, incidental. Uh, a new constitutional design must place weight on the structural relationship between the devolved governments and the government in London. It is to your capacity as that for the whole UK and for that making English laws. And once far-reaching devolution is introduced across England, I would imagine much of the English government work within Westminster will be taken away from it, leaving it space to focus on more strategic, island-wide functions. And alongside it, uh, I could see value in the House of Lords representing better the various regions across the UK, but it's key for me, and I'm taking up a point that John highlighted here at the very beginning, it's key for me that the Joint Ministerial Committee continues as a stronger forum of natures, so as not to, of nations, and so as not to confuse the uh, concerns of regional devolution within England with that of the uh, um, national relationships across uh, the Isles. And the work of Gordon Brown's uh, commission here is important. Uh, but more broadly, uh, we need to step back, uh, understand that 85% of the UK's population rests within England, which is a is an intolerably highly centralised uh, uh, arrangement. And through releasing powers, releasing sovereignty, releasing um, responsibility uh, uh, for fundraising from Whitehall, uh, Westminster, more, uh, we'd be able to put... England in a better situation and therefore to knock on effect the uh, formalization of other relationships with the existing parliaments would become uh, part of a natural and more stable framework uh, for future uh, for our future workings. Very good. One of the functions of, of the state of course is to uh, project um, the country and its people to, to the outside world. Um, what sort of a, a job do you think the 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 UK um, is doing in the international arena? Um, would it be beneficial to this projection if it had a different internal structure? Uh, has Brexit in particular affected the, the status and prestige of the United Kingdom um, in the outside world? Go back to Glundur first and then come back to John. Uh, I... Uh... Uh, yes, I, I think it has possibly affected, uh, certainly it's affected uh, how people uh, see us. And also, I suspect, uh, elements of the negotiations didn't uh, uh, show us in our best light. Uh, you know, states create supranational institutions to tackle key border issues uh, where there are common interests. You know, delegating, transferring aspects of sovereign authority in the process. Uh, this is, you know, this is quite natural. You know, in turn, these institutions exercise their responsibilities with binding effect on states as seen by the European Union. Uh, but it's not just the European Union. You know, we've been operating on similar bases in the past, with the, and we still do, uh, with the United Nations, with the World Trade Organization, with the International Monetary Fund, NATO. You know, there, you know, the spirit of partnership and the understanding that uh, uh, the transfer of an element of sovereign authority or sovereign rights. Are, is allowable and is natural. It's something that's ingrained um, throughout the world today. Intriguingly, you could say the EU has blurred the margins between the constitutional models contrasting of a confederation and that of a federal state. Um, it's fundamentally confederal in nature due to the sovereignty status of its members, but operates, many might argue, on a federal mode in its spheres of competence. Uh, competence. Um, and this is a form of, uh, dare I say, confederal federalism. But we all today, I mean, the majority of nations, uh, peoples, uh, operate in a world where different levels of government have different responsibilities. And it's, uh, I think, better understood in some places than others. And much of our debates 
and some of our discussions even the, earlier in this conversation has been in better understanding or better allocating which responsibilities, uh, which tiers of governance uh, should uh, should rest where. Uh, it's a shift of perception, I believe. We do need to um, uh, 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 promote the discussion of how do we release sovereignty, release powers from Westminster, because in doing that, uh, that conversation not just works within the UK, but also it better works and better frames our thinking in relation to our relationships globally with others. It's a two-way process. Good. John, would you like to comment on that? I think there's there's no doubt that the Brexit decision has been almost impossible for the UK government to explain to other states. It is as simple as that. They see it as an act of uh, incomprehensible self-harm. And and it's understandable because of, for all of the economic, you know, it has weakened our, our position of diplomatic leadership of the United Kingdom. It certainly weakened our own economic um, uh, position. The, the almost symbolic thing that they couldn't get copies of Boris Johnson's book to the book launch in Brussels because of EU customs regulations that sort of sums up back to the nature of the problem. But I think it's so. So it has been enormously harmful. But I think it's also revealed something that w people outside don't understand, and we haven't discussed enough, which is that foreign policy of the United Kingdom is not the foreign policy of a union state, unitary state, but actually the foreign policy that comes from a multi-nation state in which one part is. Glendara said is 85% of the population. So not only was the, the great bulk of the Leave vote in England that produced a different result to the one in Scotland and a very Anglo-centric view of what Brexit should be like has created unique problems. I mean, some people will say opportunities, but unique difficulties in the position of Northern Ireland in relation to the EU and the Union. And of course, going back further in time, we could never have done UK devolution if we had been outside the uh, EU. It was only the fact that large areas of essentially business law were set within the European Union that made the model of devolution we chose at the turn of the century feasible in the first place. So inevitably, Brexit has damaged us externally, but it is also revealed these huge internal difficulties that arise from it and you know to some extent that's been masked in in britain itself by by the demise of the sme smp which is almost nothing to do with brexit but at the point at which the smp was capitalizing on the remain vote in scotland it was giving nationalism uh, a, a, and independence a renewed boost so i think we need to have both a discussion about how the United Kingdom genuinely resets relationships with Europe in particular, but the rest of the world, but also a discussion about how much each part of the United Kingdom needs to be taken into account when you were formulating foreign policy. Foreign policy is a reserved power, but it doesn't alter the fact that foreign policy questions can look very different if you're in London, the rest of England, Wales, Scotland or Northern Ireland. But uh, one last word from each of you. Um, are you optimistic that the sort of um, change of mind, the sort of discussion, the sort of debate that we've been advocating here um, can take place, will take place over the next four years of this um, new government? Glendora, briefly, what do you think? Well, it's my view that some sort of federally inspired reconstitution of these isles that balances, on the one hand, the contrasting aspirations of unionism and its centralizing forces on the one hand and the national ambitions for cementing sovereignty um, on the other uh, is one that might uh, lead us to uh, better ground. You know, we may as well accept that a measure of friction is and will always be a feature of our isle-wide interactions and relationships at both a political and governmental level. But to mitigate this demands greater maturity of approach by our parliamentarians yeah. and also institutional arrangements robust enough to formally understand, manage and consider differing priorities. So for firstly, embracing variations in territorial contexts and secondly, 
promoting our shared values and visions, we can confidently advance, I hope, the uh, expectations of citizens' rights across uh, the UK, these right. isles, including those of England and its regions. Good. Thanks very much. John, how would you summarise it? Uh, well, I can be optimistic about could. Uh, I'm not so uh, so optimistic about will. But let me tell you why the best ground for optimism is that the economic, social and political challenges facing the UK government and also the Labour Party in Wales and Scotland require movement down this line. In other words, if you want to deliver in terms of what you've talked about, living standards, public services, economic regeneration, you cannot do that without having a decentralization from Whitehall. Whitehall does not can't build a railway, that does not have the capacity to do these things effectively. Secondly, Labour unionism is is the predominant mood at the moment in Westminster, but those elections are looming in Wales, they're lo looming in Scotland, and it is very unlikely that the Labour Party in Wales or Scotland will want to fight those elections on the basis of vote Labour because we've got a UK Labour government. I mean, that would require a, a transformation of, of social and economic conditions in those two nations that's unlikely to happen on the timescale to those elections. So inevitably, it will be the case that Labour will have to define the relationship between the UK uh, government and the Scottish government, the UK government and the Welsh government more clearly, more distinctly, not becoming nationalist parties, but actually becoming parties of those nations. So I think both the political challenges that face the government and the policy challenges do push them to open up these issues, maybe in a in a language or a way that 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 is not the language that constitutionalists have talked about, but as things that are necessary to deliver for the people of the United Kingdom what they want. So I think that if the government is sensitive to delivering what it has promised, then they will inevitably have to deal with some of these issues, and then you can't put this debate back in the bottle. That sounds rather like what some people talk about the Brexit. Um reset, that the government will be forced into a, a different view from the one it apparently is taking at the moment. In both issues, um, those who live longest will know most, won't they? <laughs> Thanks very much indeed to both of you. It was a very stimulating and informative discussion, and I, I hope our viewers have enjoyed it. Goodbye, and thank you to thank you. our speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you, thank you Brendan. Thank you.